Welcome, Matt. Welcome to the show. Such an honor and pleasure to have you on the show. Mate, thanks for asking me. I'm really looking forward to it. It's, uh, it's yeah, going to be good to have a chat. Great. So to kick things off, what we can do is uh, if you could just uh, give the viewers a little description about what you've been doing so far. And what I'm interested specifically is when did and how did India happen? 2013 and 2015. So if you could just give us a little uh, trailer into your journey so far, it'll be great. Yeah, okay, no problems. Uh, so I've been in within strength and conditioning and sports science in this area now for sort of 13, 14 years, so quite a while before I sort of started in India. Um, was just personal training a long, long time ago. I uh, got to a point where I decided I needed to do something a bit more than, than just personal training and found out about an, found out about an exercise science degree at the time and uh, that sort of led me down this path. Uh, while I was doing that, I was doing some work with a number of rugby league teams, um, still doing some personal training stuff on the side. Uh, and in my second year at university, um, started a what well, at the time was a six week internship with uh, Newcastle Knights, which are a professional rugby league club here in Australia, working in their junior development pathways. Um, and I'd set up to do uh, my honours degree through them. So in Australia, we have a three year undergraduate, and at the end of that, you can do a year of a research based uh, honours degree. So I was doing that with, uh, with the Newcastle Knights. And one of my lecturers who was a supervisor for that, he had actually gone to India previous to me and worked with uh, the, the national hockey team there, basically setting up um, that sort of sports science, uh, strength and conditioning side of things for, for Hockey India at the time. So he was on sabbatical for from his university lecturing role, um, right. came back to, to Australia and we were just happened to be chatting uh, back in the office very, very early in the new year. And he said to me, I need someone to go overseas. And at the time, I'd sort of lined up to do um, my, my finish off my honours and then go for my PhD with the Newcastle Knights. But I immediately put up my hand and um, so I said, right, that's you know, international experience as an S&C coach. You don't sort of get that thrown your way too often and a bit of to and fro, but essentially having the right conversation at the right time and with the right person sort of, yeah, led me to, to going over there in, I mean, when you're in 2013. So we, um, I spent just under two years there in the first time based out of Patiala up in Punjab. Yeah. A little bit of time in Bhopal in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, I think Patiala was a, a much nicer place to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Profile's a bit in the middle of nowhere, but it's okay. Uh, so finished up there after uh, Asian Games in 2014. Uh, was it with the men's team or women's team? With the women's team. So both team. both times I was in India were with the women's team. Right. Uh, and so then um, it was mid uh, mid 2015. So I did a, after I finished in India the first time, went and did six months work with the Malaysian men's hockey team, mm -hmm. uh, and then I got a call from the high performance director at Hockey Hockey India, sort of uh, back end of 2015, asking uh, asking me to come back over. And the girls had qualified for the Olympics by that stage, um, yeah. but they they had no one to sort of fulfil my role, so. Uh, that opportunity to obviously go back and, and go through to the Rio Olympics and sort of finish, I'll say finish what we started in, in 2013 because it was a very um, developmental phase, I suppose, for the girls where they'd never really had a, a highly structured sports science or strength and conditioning program before that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a yeah, really good opportunity for me to be able to go back, um, work with those girls, continue that development. And obviously, to go to an Olympics was um, a bit of a no-brainer. I think yeah. you certainly don't get that opportunity, and there's not many people, let alone S and C coaches in the world, who can sort of say they've done that. Um, which yeah, 
very, very thankful for to be able to have gone over there and done that at the time. So, yeah, my my getting to India was, I'll say by chance, we're having the right conversation at the right time, but it was a lot of work before that, I suppose, of um, yeah. developing my own skills and developing my own coaching knowledge to be able to have those conversations with people and then have them recommend me on um, for the role. So, Absolutely. Wasn't it after uh, 36 years that India qualified for the Rio Olympics, the hockey team? So the, the the women was actually the first time they'd ever qualified. So oh, okay. they yeah, you're correct in it was the first time they'd been to the Olympics in 36 years, but they they actually went for the first time uh, in the Moscow boycott. So mm-hmm. when a lot of other a lot of other countries pulled out, India was invited, but oh, they, yeah. uh, they were the first time they actually qualified. So it was a it was a pretty big achievement for the girls to to get there. Um, the Olympics didn't go the way we sort of hoped, but um, yeah, there's probably 11 other teams could say the same thing because they didn't win medals either. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that as a learning experience for all the girls that went there, myself and, and most of the staff, there was one of our staff members that had been to, a, to an Olympics before. Um, mm-hmm. Most of the girls uh, had been to either a Commonwealth or Asian Games. But I think the step up from from Commonwealth or Asian Games to Olympics is it's another world. Um, Absolutely, the pressure and and the dealing with the the status I suppose back in India of being or, or hopefully becoming an Olympian was um, it was a it was a big twelve months for those girls, um, the whole mm. squad, not just the girls that went there. So. Yeah, you were right, like you said, 36 years, but it was the first time they qualified, like you said, a massive achievement for them. Right. Since they didn't have any reference point uh, before that to, see, uh, to understand what the magnitude of an Olympic qualification would be, uh, how did the team perceive uh, the girls about being representing their country for Olympics? Did they absorb it the way how they should have absorbed it? Yeah, I think for the most part, it was it was really positive. There were times throughout that sort of 12-month period leading up to Rio where um, psychologically a few of the girls really got tested because they knew we had a squad of 33 athletes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Typically in hockey tournaments at the time, you'd be able to take 18 girls away um, and 18 would play throughout the tournament. At the Olympics, it was 16. So knowing that more than half of our squad was going to get cut and six or 17 of those girls were working, not for nothing, but working so hard yeah. for a dream they weren't going to be able to fulfil. It was very, very difficult. And uh, for the most part, it drove them really well. There were times, like I said, we probably tested them and, and there was a bit of tension between some of the players that were in similar positions or um, might have been trying to get that sort of last spot um, so to speak, but they were ro- resolved quite quickly. I think the, the group we had, even though we had um, girls from all over India, I think we had something like 37 different languages spoken within our, <laughs> within our group. Like, it's unbelievable, yeah. Uh, for the most part, they, they came together really, really well. Uh, and mm. it, it's hard to think of anything really negative to come out of that experience either for the team or for us or obviously telling some players they weren't going to go and being around their, that the camp at that time was, was pretty tough. But mm-hmm. as a whole, yeah, the ability for them to grow and to develop as, as people and um, athletes was, yeah, it, it, I don't think anything else could have done that for them. Mm-hmm. A, a few days back, uh uh, Rani, the captain of the team, she was awarded uh, the highest honor that uh, an Indian sports person could get in India. It's called the Khel Rekna. So it was, I think it was yeah. about a week back, yeah, that she got it. Yeah, uh, so was, was, was she captaining, leading the team back when you were uh, with the team? No. So when I started, uh, we had uh, Ritu Rani was the captain. Ritu yeah, was yeah. Um, from Haryana, and then. 
when we went to the Olympics, we had a, a Manipuri girl, Sushila Chanu, and Sushila nearly didn't go to the Olympics. Uh, she ruptured, completely ruptured her ACL about oh. nine, nine or ten weeks out from from the Olympics and it was just a, a freak sort of training thing where she, she turned on the pitch and she tripped over a girl that was directly behind her and um, we didn't think it was that bad to start off with. Mm. Yeah, spoke to a physio or the next sort of two days and found out that we'd ruptured or she'd ruptured it and like, the, the only real option was surgery or nothing at all and we ended up trying conservatively managing her and uh, put her in a put her in a leg brace mm-hmm. which essentially acted as a, as her ACL for the, the 10 weeks and got her to an Olympics and got her to play um, wow. at the Olympics one ACL which was oh. and, and like I said she was the captain of the team and she was outstanding um, mm. for a young girl at the time to go through sort of she was the captain of the team, be told basically your dream is over and yeah. emotionally come back from that, um, physically do all the things she needed to do to get herself ready to play and, and whatever again. I mean, it was, I think that's probably one of the biggest highlights of my coaching career would be watching Sush come out of yeah, a very, very dark point to then. Um, that have been really tough for the entire team as well, right? Yeah, I, yeah, it was um, it was a very tough day. That when when all the girls learned exactly what she'd done, they'd all been around that sort of thing previously and knew that hey, look, this is you know, nine months of the rest of her life that she's dedicating to that. Um, to then see her turn around, it was it it made everyone or gave everyone a little bit of inspiration. I think we had to see the way Sheila turned that round and. Uh, and get back on the on the pitch, ready to start, and watching her line up in the first game. That was a, uh, I think it's pretty emotional for everyone in the team. Mm. So uh, yeah, Rani, Rani took over from Sush, as far as I know. Right, both Rio. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Well, I think I'm fairly sure Sushila went and had surgery pretty well straight after that, which she needed. Um, and yeah, Rani's just gone on in leaps and bounds. I mean, she's a she's an outstanding player, um, and from what I understand, she's just developed more and more as an athlete as she's she's getting older and um, become a become a real leader within that system. From what I understand, so it's good to see. It's good to see some yeah. positive for, for women over there. Mm. Uh, what, what was your impression when you uh, first time appeared and in, in, arrived in India in 2013? Like, what was your impression before coming here? What, what were the expectations about India, and how was it similar or different? In terms of just cultural things, or, or in terms yeah, of our yeah, athletes, yeah. the uh, physical abilities of the athletes, the entire culture. How would you be received as a foreigner working in a different culture? How did it all play yeah. out during your first contract? Yeah, so my uh, my expectations or, or what I thought was going to be or happening in India, in all honesty, I had no idea. Uh, I've <laughs> never been anywhere like that before. I've travelled overseas quite a bit, a few times to Europe, but nothing, nothing like India. Um, so it was... To say that it was a culture shock was a bit of a bit of an understatement. Um, <laughs> what do you but, think? Yeah, but everyone was so welcoming um, and so happy to to see that people were coming over and giving them support. I think the girls in particular, um, the girls in particular, probably more appreciative, I think, rather compared to say the men's team over there because they'd always been sort of shelved or, or treated or not, not so much second-class citizens, but they were probably never given as much um, okay. respect to the men. And to be fair, the men were, you know, the men's you know, Indian hockey team have been outstanding for a long, long period of time, so they deserve yeah. a lot of respect. And 
the women were, were starting to get to that point now where they've been progressing for a long time. So for me to walk in there in 2013 and not immediately get respect from these girls but very, very quickly gain a lot of trust and gain a lot of respect from them because they knew I was just there to help them mm -hmm. was really, that was uh, something that we probably don't get so much here in, in Australia even um, where athletes, you have to work a lot harder to, to gain their respect um, over time. But I think uh, I found that sort of nationwide, wherever we went um, with the hockey team, people were so happy to see that we were helping, we were trying to develop uh, the female game over there and trying to sort of give those, I'll say give those girls a better life that's probably a bit overstating what we were doing, but filtering that down towards junior systems and, and filtering it down towards uh, academy systems in different states as well to try and do what we were doing at the top and, and have that effect downwards. And I think people were really, really happy with that, really uh, appreciative and, and open to what we are doing. So that, that softened the blow, I suppose, for, um, for some of the cultural differences that I had to sort of acclimatise myself to. Um, but, yeah, th just the way that Indian people would welcome us and, and welcome foreigners who could be so easily perceived as we're only there for ourselves or something like that was, was quite special to see. Um, when it came to the players themselves, I think there's the, the – I'm going to say the Indian physio, physiology, I suppose, of, of the players. I think some of the fittest athletes I've, I've ever seen and even <laughs> since, yeah, some of those girls, just unbelievable in terms of once they'd had, had a little bit of work put in them to start off with, so that – the first two years I was there were very, very much about um, development from a, a reasonable base of, of fitness, but um, trying to really push that to an international standard where they could compete with other teams, so, so Great Britain, USA, Netherlands, um, those sort of teams, Australia and New Zealand, compete with those teams on a day-to-day -day basis at tournaments. And I think when, we first, when I first went over there, that probably wasn't happening anywhere near enough. But with a little bit of um, training and development over the, the sort of first 12 months of my time there in 2013, I think the ability for those girls to match it with the best in the world was mm. unbelievable. Um, I'd, I'd like to think we'd go as far to say that we, we would have been in the top four to five fittest teams in the world, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Um, at that stage, but I think the, the the downside or where they were probably lacking a bit was their strength work um, mm. compared to say Australian in particular, New Zealand GB girls as well. Um, the Indian girls were a lot smaller for one, but yeah. they just don't have the don't have the strength background of of some of those um, Western countries. And that's where they, they really struggled. They had to learn how to use what strength they had um, to not sort of get pushed around the field so much and, and make some better decisions around how they were playing the game while we developed those things over the next sort of two to three years. And by the time I left there, they, they were a hell of a lot stronger than what they were. They're probably never going to be at the level of, of an Australian or, or New Zealand or, or GB yeah. or... Yes, but mm. I think the, the the physiological makeup of of Indians in general probably doesn't tend itself for that sort of um, or for the females anyway doesn't lend itself to, to being hugely strong. Yeah, um, yeah to some of the Western cultures. Mm. It's interesting because. Uh about last week, I was watching an interview with uh, Dandraj Pillai, the ex-captain. Uh, yep. So he was, um, he, he said uh, the strength of the team was purely skill-based. 
Indians, in his observation at least, he clearly feels exactly like how you said, that there is a strength difference between the uh, other nations. So when you took over the team, uh, were you trying to play for the strength, which means capitalize on the ability of the players to expose, express their skill rather than trying to make them physically brutal animals like GB or Australian would be? How was the yeah. primary thought process like for you when you took over the position? Definitely trying to continue with their, their strengths. So obviously as, a, as an SMC coach, my role probably wasn't that there wasn't to work directly on their strengths in terms of their hockey technical ability as such. Obviously that's going to be left up to their coach. But yeah. what, we, what we needed to develop was the ability for those girls to do more of that and more of that at a high, high quality level. So when I first went over there and sat down with the coach, that was sort of one of the things we spoke about was they, they need to do more of that, that technical work Mm. but they don't have the capacity yet to do so. So it was straight away one of the biggest thing for me was, that, okay, we've, we've got to increase that um, aerobic capacity um, for the girls just to do more high-quality training for a longer period of time. So rather than have a, a two-hour session, which was fairly typical for us, and the first 40 minutes of that would be really, really good and then it would tail off, we needed to make sure that gets up to 90, 100, and 110 minutes. So the, the vast majority of that session is mm -hmm. kept at a really high standard. Uh, so without a doubt, when I think when, when Dhanaraj Pillay says things like that, that the skill of the Indian players is their biggest asset, yeah. it's probably not so true anymore, I think, in the past, without a doubt, but... The men and the women have progressed so far in in their physical capacities that um, they're able to execute execute those skills for a much longer period of time now. So I don't think the deficit between technical yeah. ability and physiological capacities are so different than what they probably were five or what are we talking about seven eight years ago now. But mm. yeah, when I first got there, without a doubt, the um, the technical abilities far outweigh their physiological capacities for sure. Um, so was the primary training center located up in Patiala uh, for, for the women? Yeah, so um, when we were all based in um, NIS, Patiala, mm -hmm. uh, we, we did come for a few camps or, or whenever we travel overseas, which was fairly frequently the last sort of week of that may be down in Delhi. Um, the camp moved at one point to Bhopal and was, was based in Bhopal for quite a while. And then when I came back in 2015, we moved down to Bangalore, which yeah. Bangalore facilities in terms of um, Sports Authority of India, as far as that goes for hockey, was, was far and above um, what we had in, in either Bhopal or Patiala from, from my perspective. And right. then for just for, for the girls to live or for the athletes to live and then for us as, as coaches as well, Bangalore, as you're probably well aware, is uh, much, much nicer to live in than yeah, somewhere like Bhopal or, or Patiala where they're just so isolated. Hmm. So how did a typical day look like for you when you were with the team here? Like how was the schedule for the training? Yeah, so we, uh, we, we train generally twice a day. So typically if we had, uh, if we had a, a strength day or a gym day, it would always be gym in the mornings. Uh, we tried, mm -hmm. did try gym in the afternoons at some point and it just it didn't work well. Uh, we weren't getting yeah. the output that we, we were in the morning. So, Whenever we had gym, it was always in the morning. So that was typically three days a week. Mm -hmm. uh, then we'd either have we'd have training in the afternoons, depending on where we were in Patiala at times. Uh, middle of summer up there, you could be you know, forty. We hit forty eight degrees at some point. Yeah. So when I say training in the afternoon, sometimes we train at eight thirty at night, and, and mm -hmm. you finish at ten thirty because it's just it's too hot to train otherwise. Yeah. Um, within that, 
so that we'd have three gym sessions a week. We'd have five to seven hockey sessions, depending on uh, where we were in a schedule. Um, typically, we'd have three sort of three designated recovery sessions during the week, and that could be pool, it could have been yoga, it could have been stretching sessions, a few other mm. sort of things. Uh, so if we sort of say typical day, it would be a training session in the morning, somewhere around 6.30, 7.30 start, again, depending on the time of year. Um, during winter, especially again in Patiala, we could be starting at minus one degrees. So yeah. typically start a little bit later. Uh, go from there to our training session, typically straight into recovery. So whether that's pull, whether that was stretching, whatever it may have been at the time, that is mm-hmm. typically something around a 40 minute period. Uh, the girls were really good at going and having lunch and then going straight to bed. They loved a good <laughs> afternoon nap. Uh, not, yeah. not many of them do afternoon nap. Uh, and that would be my time to go back and have a look at um, whatever our monitoring things were at the time. We did a lot of jump testing. Um, my second stint there, we, we had GPS as well. So we'd be looking at a lot of what the GPS stuff was going, uh, what we were seeing coming out of that. And then uh, pretty much every day, it'd be sitting around with the coach in the afternoon as well, sort of looking at what we've got coming up that afternoon and making sure that we were on the same page with the things that we planned out for the week or, or the month in advance to, to you know, make sure we're, we're trending where we needed to go mm-hmm. rather than having you know, differing of opinions and getting to a training session and going, hey, what are you doing? I thought we were doing this and we're now doing that. So mm-hmm. that was a fairly typical day. Um, Probably a lot, a lot busier the second time around when we were based in Bangalore, uh, because we had yes, because we probably a lot more staff meetings, working with the physio and stuff to really stay on top of any any little injuries or whatever we had. We also had a psychologist there at the time, so the girls would have um, twice a week sort of group mm-hmm. group psychology sessions. Um, which could have been anything from painting um, fun stuff more more so yeah. than, than I suppose typical what we look at or think about when we talk about psychology work. So speaking with those um, people within my staff group as well to sort of make sure that what we're all doing again was tying in with each other yeah. um, and no one was sort of going off on their own little tangents that was conflicting with, with anything else in the program. So, yeah, definitely yeah. more busier, busier in, in Bangalore than anywhere Bangalore. else. Yeah. And, uh, and what, what sort of uh, uh, monitoring equipment tools do you have access to? You mentioned GPS and you mentioned jump profiling. So do you have access to force plates or contact maps? Uh, no. So when, I, when we were doing all that jump stuff, it was all using gym aware. Uh, so the girls, the girls got pretty, pretty accustomed to walk into the gym and they knew they'd do their movement prep work and then before every gym session they, they do the jump so that would be three times a week. Uh, mm-hmm. Whenever we toured, the, the gym aware would go with us as well. So it was, uh, that was a, such a great tool because it was so easy to, to transport yeah. out of the world. Um, customs didn't like it too much when you're taking a little gym aware <laughs> box through yeah. a few times I'll explain what that was, but uh, everywhere we go, the girls, they knew they were jumping. Um, we did a lot of work when we travelled as well. So I presented at the um, ASCA conference a few years ago about our, how we dealt with a lot of travel and, and how we used our, our jump profiles before and after flying to mm-hmm. look at how well girls have recovered from that. Uh, so, so what we sort of found, travelling uh, west to east took a lot longer. Um, so typically when, when girls have jumped, I'm looking at uh, mean velocity, or mean and peak velocity throughout those, uh, just the body weight counter movement jump. Mm-hmm. And what they would do in the seven days leading up to that as well. So... Whenever we travel more than 
nine hours, less than sort of nine hours, didn't really make a whole lot of difference. Mm -hmm. um, but over nine hours, we found that some girls would take up to sort of 72 hours before they would be back at their pre-flight status. Mm, um, interesting. So that really guided what we were doing with them when we when we got somewhere. So I think at one point we had a had a trip where it was about thirty seven hours travel from Bangalore to um, Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. So just a couple of different plane flights and, and obviously a long time. And so four days later, we're still seeing the girls. We, we couldn't push them to sprint. We couldn't push them to lift heavy um, just through what was going on with our, our jump stuff at the time. Uh, so that was probably one of the biggest things we'd use for really acute monitoring what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Uh, as I said, we, we had GPS, so we were looking at what's happening over a week, what's happening over a month. Um, by the time... We, we didn't make a lot of decisions, we didn't make any decisions of that for probably the first six months at least of, of collecting that information. It was more just, okay, what trends can we see if we design a session to look like, okay, it should be a seven in an RPE scale, what does that look like on a, on a GPS to right. make sure that what we thought we were doing was actually marrying up with those objective numbers coming out of the GPS ship. So... We started to make more and more, probably not so much make the decisions out of it, but inform the, the uh, training session makeup and inform what we were doing throughout a week and how we changed that uh, across a training cycle uh, based on what was happening there. So whether, I'm not sure how many people are aware, but typically within a, within a hockey setting, we might have a four to six week camp um, typically then travel for three to six weeks, depending on where we were going, what the tournament was, come back, have a week off, and then do the whole thing all over again. So it was not so like where I suppose in, in Australia now we're very much used to, okay, we've got a defined pre-season, we've got a defined pre-competition phase, then we're into competition and we have a few weeks off. The hockey cycle wasn't like that at all. So how we dealt with those GPS uh, numbers and, and how we dealt with girls when we can and can't push them was probably a lot more, a lot, um, I'll say very specific in how we went about that um, to make sure that if we're leading into a tournament, we, we, we want to make sure we, we're getting a certain characteristic or a certain physiological um, attribute targeted and right everything else just sort of stays the same if, if possible rather than let's just throw everything at them all at once and get them as strong as we can, get them as fit as we can. It was, it was probably a bit more methodical than that, I think. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, do, do you play hockey? No. And before... <laughs> Before I turned up to the uh, turned up to the pitch in India, I'd never seen a full hockey game in my life, um, and I'm, I'm a bit ashamed to admit this. But we the first session when we turned up, and uh, the groundsman walked over and he turned the sprinklers on, and I ran over to him like, "Mate, we're about to start training. What are you doing?" <laughs> and I had no idea that yes, the hockey pitch is watered every single time they use it oh, training yeah. games. So, I learned that lesson very quickly, but um, right. yeah, I love the game now. Even now, I quite try and watch um, a fair bit of it. So it's, I think, right. once you're that involved in something, you, and you you learn that much about it, you can't help but become interested. So yeah, absolutely. And how, how does the typical performance testing battery look like when uh, you were uh, leading the assembly department? Yeah. Um, so as I said, we we jump every um, or three times a week, depending on where we were and, and probably sometimes four if we're overseas. In a camp setting, uh, we'd all, every time the girls come, well, not every time, just about every time the girls come into in the camp, we'd uh, they'd run a yo-yo test. Um, and that was typically more so for the girls or, or trying to identify the girls who 
in that three to six week block that the team had been away traveling around the world, uh, making mm. sure they'd stayed up with their, their programs or whatever they needed to do, what they were given while they were away. So every time the team was away, those other girls went um, back home and were back to their academies and, and were doing the testing there. So always a yo-yo coming back into camp. Um, every or, or four times a year, we ran a test. We called it the two-kilometre suicide. Very, very similar to the Bronco um, mm-hmm. that most coaches would probably be quite aware of. But because of the different line markings uh, on the hockey pitch, it was run a little bit differently. But essentially, a, a two-kilometre time trial, um, four times a year. Um, concurrently or, or around the same time as that, we strength test. So 3RM squat. We included a 3RM deadlift only because they'd previously done it before. Um, right. And then one of our one of the biggest metrics that I like to get girls to try and do was chin-ups um, mm. to start off with. It was just trying to get every female in the squad to do a chin-up and then oh, how many good number. do. Um, but by the end of end of the time there, it was definitely how much could, how many could you do and not so much just can you do one. Um, they were probably our big strength metrics uh, we, we tried to focus on, but it became, I think we got to a point with most of the girls that we very rarely tried to chase getting better strength numbers. Um, mm-hmm. We found they were... They were, they were plateauing off quite quickly. But what they had was adequate to compete at that international stage. So yeah. a lot of stuff that we went to after that probably wasn't ever going to improve strength a whole lot, but um, looking at like stretch shortening cycle stuff, so a lot of more plyometric, a lot more power-based work, uh, a lot more really elastic stuff. So working on a lot more reactive, explosive things rather than just strength metrics, I suppose. Um, so but that, that was our, our typical battery, like I said. So we had a yo-yo, a 2K, 2K time trial, um, squat, deadlift, chin-up were our big ones that would happen around each camp. Uh, like I said, the, the jump stuff was something we'd look at very, very frequently as well. Mm-hmm. So that would be a, a basic testing battery. Was it a uh, criteria for selection in the national team? We did have. So the only criteria, we didn't use the strength stuff. We did definitely use the, uh, the yo-yo scores. Mm-hmm. So we had to have girls that were above, uh, I think we had it at 16.8 was our, our minimum run. criteria. Um, how we came up with that, I we did have discussion around the time. I couldn't tell you how it ended up being 16-8, but it was something that mm-hmm. basically if you're not there, uh, right. you're not going to be at the level that we, we wanted to be able to play or the girls needed to or the, the capacity they needed to sustain um, with the speed of the game. When just before I, I came to India, hockey went from two halves to four quarters and the mm-hmm. speed of the game obviously increased quite dramatically yeah. with that, with rolling subs as well. So if girls weren't at sort of that 16, 8 level, they just weren't going to be able to have enough output across the game to be um, to be effective. All right. So reflecting back upon your time here in India, uh, how did it shape you as a coach? Uh, what sort of benefits uh, have you derived from being here in a different cultural environment? But completely yeah, different that's, psychological attributes. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, probably the two biggest things, without a doubt, would be adaptability and and my ability to communicate with uh, with athletes. Mm-hmm. Walking into gyms or training centres where the the equipment that you might have, if there's any equipment at all, could be really substandard. Um, some of the Unfortunately, some of the places we stayed were pretty horrible, to be honest. Um, yeah, adapting to those sort of things and, and getting the, the athletes as well to adapt to those was something that we had to become pretty good at. 
Uh, so where other teams might be around the world and they'd be really unhappy with a four-star hotel, we knew that going away, our girls are looking at a four-star hotel and going, look, this is amazing compared to what we have to deal with on a day-to-day basis or what we've had in other places. Right. So being able to adapt training sessions because, okay, we've only got a hotel gym now was pretty easy because some of the facilities we we might have had in, in places we stayed in India were probably worse than what we had in that motel. Yeah. Um, so now as a coach being able to come into a, a gym session and go, okay, well, there's another team in here, so we've got to change what we're doing or hold on, these players aren't at, this, at their physical readiness level that I thought they would be today, so I need to change something. I, I find that, I wouldn't say easy, but it's a lot easier than mm-hmm. what I would have been before I went to India. So before I would have went to India, I think, uh, yeah. here's my program for today and that's what we're doing and that's it. There's no questions asked, whereas I think now I sort of get a program and I go, here's what we would sort of plan to do today and then I'll speak to the athlete and have a chat with them and I go, okay, well, now in my head I'm thinking this is what we need to do today off the back of that. Um, with following on to that, that the ability to communicate with people who speak English as a second language, without a doubt, was that was a huge hurdle. And particularly with with Indian females where a lot of them were, it was sort of culturally ingrained in them that they'd rather say nothing or do nothing so they couldn't make a mistake and wouldn't get in trouble for that. So for us to be able to communicate to them, hey, you know what, it's actually okay for you to make a mistake because it's probably a really good learning point for you and communicate that you're not going to get in trouble from that. Um, so the, the feedback, I was really, really careful and tried to be quite thoughtful with a lot of the feedback I'd give to these girls to make sure that it was a lot of positive reinforcement mm-hmm. and rather than say, okay, look, you, that's wrong or, hey, that's just not good enough, frame a message as, hey, look, this is an opportunity we've got to work on that and get it make sure this gets better for us so when it gets to a game situation, whatever it may be. But framing what we perceive as negative things as an opportunity um, was one of the biggest things that I learned really on because people who are scared to make mistakes for fear of that the repercussion just never learn. They never progress. Yeah. But if we allow, we allow them that ability to... to make mistakes and we present that as coaches as an opportunity to learn i found that people relish in that they they love that ability because they especially at that level international level they want to get better themselves we generally don't need to give them depending on the athlete we generally don't need to give them a lot of motivation right. but sometimes how we frame that message is is what i found to be the biggest um barrier to break down Um, and I think that's something that I was able to do really well out of India because of the cultural differences we had within the athletes there and because of how they learned best I suppose. Right. Did you you have a translator for the to understand what you were saying? (laughs) No. The only translator we had was a um, a girl from Bangalore, and right. she her mother was an English teacher, and and she had perfect English. She was amazing. So if we ever needed to, the only problem was she spoke um, I can't, what's the the language in in Bangalore again? She spoke uh, Tamil, Canada, Canada. Yes, yeah, sorry, not Tamil, um, and Hindi. So. If the girls from Manipur didn't understand or the girls from Kolkata or something didn't understand, mm. we were in a bit of trouble. So mm. most of the time, though, and, and as you probably know, mm. most Indian people uh, have a, a degree of English that mm. you can work with. Um, yeah. And there's always sign language 
both we were all very very good at uh, you know talking with their hands and talking with their bodies by the end of it because you just sometimes you need to everyone yeah. can uh, understand when you're running on the spot they know what it means right absolutely so Matt to shift gears from uh, this a little bit uh, when did uh, PhD happen and w- why do you think that's important for an SMC? how has it helped you or shaped your career so far yeah so PhD for me started uh, after after Rio um, I moved back back home and, and uh, moved down to Melbourne to start that uh, it was in the pipeline for, for quite a while but obviously being overseas was never going to work the way I'd sort of wanted it to. So it was that decision after Rio to, to pull the pin on being overseas, come back and start that in, at, in Melbourne at Tribe University. Um, and it's been a, it's certainly been a journey that I think as, a, as an S&C coach in terms of how it changes what I do, say, in the gym or anything like that, I wouldn't say it's had a, a huge bearing on that. But how I look at probably programs and how I look at what goes into a program as a whole, not just the gym or, or not just the running or, or whatever it may be, but that whole sports science thing, I think, has become a lot more critical about, okay, well, why are we putting that in? Why are we, you know, why are we taking this out? Like, if we're going to take something out, are we replacing it with something? Um, yeah. Is the testing we're doing the testing we need to be doing. Uh, those sort of things, I think that the level of critical thinking has changed a lot more throughout my PhD because it's just the way I, th- I feel we need to look at research to, and I, I try to translate across that to, to my SNC, SNC stuff as well. Um, without a doubt, my, my technical knowledge around some of the physiological characteristics of muscle architecture, um, short, short, short stretch, shortening cycle, sorry, uh, and some of those things have, have changed significantly. Like I've got a lot more knowledge in those areas because of the, the area of study that I'm looking at. But as that relates, again, back to an S&C coach, I think the biggest things are just that ability to really critique what you're doing and why. And I think if I went back and did a lot of the programs and a lot of the things that I did in India with the same thought process that I have, thought process that I have now, they probably change quite significantly. Not that I'm saying I don't think I did anything too wrong when I was there the first time, uh, but just as you grow and as you develop and as you learn, you, you find new ways of doing things or you find this is how we refine some of those methods along the way. And I feel that's probably helped me uh, or the, the PhD process has helped me do that sort of stuff um, okay. probably not for not for every coach I don't think it's um, I don't think it's a process that every coach needs to go through and some some people may get those same skills through other other methods but um, for me that's been the stuff that I take out of it purely for the, the coaching stuff without a doubt mm. So for someone who is working as a full-time SMC, if uh, let's say they want to understand what sort of time commitment it would take uh, enrolling for a part-time PhD, uh, what would be your uh, observations about that? Part-time PhD, I think, would be would be quite a doable thing for, for a full-time SMC coach. Um, typically in Australia anyway, a, a full-time PhD is um, three and a half to four years, depending on, uh, depending on obviously a few things that hopefully go your way. Some people take a bit longer than that. Uh, so when they, when we talk about part-time here, it's generally a seven, seven-ish year process. Yeah. So, uh, for, for a full-time coach, I think to be able to undertake that, if you were looking in, in terms of just an absolute time commitment, somewhere in the vicinity of 15 to 20 hours a week is probably what you'd be looking at on top of, of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But if, you, if you're able to structure your PhD in a way that your job is feeding 
your PhD in terms of, okay, what, what areas are you looking at? Is it tying in with some of the things you're doing with your, your athletes? So say your data collection is happening organically because you're doing it anyway through your job. Yeah. All of those things then don't really change. It's, it's extending your knowledge base probably a lot deeper than what you would if you were just doing your job and not researching in that area. But I don't feel like it needs to be this thing where you, okay, I'm an S&C coach over here and I'm a PhD candidate or an academic over here and, and those two paths never cross. I think uh, you can very easily and, and smartly combine those two things to get the best out of both worlds. Uh, and the S&C stuff can also inform what, what your PhD practice is looking like as well. So... For people that wanted to go down that path, uh, that would be probably one of the biggest things that I'd be saying to them is how can you potentially tie that in with what you're currently doing? Mm-hmm. Um, so you're not all of a sudden taking on, let's say, two jobs, but you're just extending what you're, what you're doing a little bit further. Um, that, I think that makes sense. Yeah, it does, it does, absolutely. So why you were why you were here in India? Did you get a chance to interact with the Indian SNCs or in the SNC community at all? Yeah, a bit. Um, my I was mostly limited to to uh, side coaches, sports authority mm-hmm. of India coaches. Uh, but when we travel around the different places and meet up with different people, I got to meet quite a few coaches around the place. Um, I had a, a really good friend. Uh, in Delhi or some friends in Delhi that are still there uh, who introduced me to a lot of coaches that work with like Indian soccer league teams, um, some of the local yeah. cricket team, um, a yeah. couple of the Kabaddi coaches as well. So met people a lot um, along the way, but it wasn't something, I was never able to spend a lot of time with a lot, any of those coaches purely because we were, if we're in camp, then we're, like I said, you know, we're two days a week or two times a day training or, or doing whatever it needs to be at the time. So, unfortunately, didn't get a lot of time with them. Mm. So, so, my final question to you would be, uh, knowing what you know about the Indian SMC community, uh, what, what would be your uh, suggestions uh, or advices for the upcoming SMCs here in India? Because to an extent, the community here in India is still growing, still at infancy. So what would be our uh, thoughts on it? Yeah, I think you're spot on in the fact that it's growing for one. So I think when I first went there in 2013, strength and conditioning was something that was a bit dark ages still without a doubt. I mean, that's seven years ago. That's not long at all. Yeah. Um, so even even in strength-based sports like your kabaddi or, or like weightlifting, those sort of things, a lot of the the things that I was seeing within the SI system were taken from like the 70s or 80s. They just never changed in what they were doing. I compare that to um, this year being over there um, with you and, and teaching the ASCA Level 2 course while we were there. And the quality of coaches was unbelievably different. Hmm. Um, so I think... You're 100% correct in the fact that it's growing and not just growing in terms of more people in there, but growing in terms of the knowledge base within that. I think the for fair, for fair reason, the majority of, of S&C coaches there would be primarily involved in cricket. Um, yeah. There's so many academies and, and clubs and, and whatever else around there that that's where the majority of jobs are going to be. And, while I understand that's probably what a lot of coaches look towards because it's paying or, or they grew up playing cricket so now they want to transfer their skills, I think probably one of the biggest bits of advice I'd be would be try and move away from that. Try and go and experience something different and experience, even if it's not a different sport, but experience it how a different coach works. So a different head coach works and how that program changes and how that's different to what you've always known. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest things that I've found with the Indian coaches that we we were teaching earlier this year and and guys and girls that I've met when I previously lived there was they were a bit hesitant 
or, or quite scared to take a bit of a leap of faith and, all right, I'm going to go try something completely new. Yeah. Um, I, for a lot of coaches, particularly some of those guys at level two early this year, I'd, I'd give them the advice of, hey, look, quite difficult at the moment, obviously, with things going on in the world, but you know what, it's probably time for you guys to leave India for a while, go and see what it's like coaching other sports in other countries. Sure. Um, from, from a personal perspective, some of the best coaches that I know have been from Australia. I worked overseas in, in other countries and they've been able to bring their skills back and work even better at what they do. So I've known a number of guys um, working in China, for example, um, yeah. that have been able to come back to Australia and they've just progressed their careers uh, even even more quickly, quickly than what they probably would have because their ability to learn those skills of adaptability and communication and all those things that you don't get by just being stuck in that same little bubble you've always been in. Uh, you have to test those things. You have to develop them. So for Indian coaches, if they could find um, a sport that they're interested in overseas and, and find a way to, okay, how can I go over somewhere and do an internship doing that sport or, or find a coach overseas and how can I go over there and work with this person for a, a period of time, take those skills back to India and I think you'd find the the community would benefit so much from it but right. also the skills, the skills of everyone involved over there would be so much better for it because obviously once they can bring those skills back from, from wherever they have gone and start disseminating that information around it, it, it just spreads like wildfire and I think that that would be a really powerful thing for a lot of Indian coaches who have already got a good skill set and a good base and probably need to take another step um, that may not be in the direction they think of somewhere in India, it may be somewhere else or overseas. That would be something that I'd probably look to give a lot of people over there some guidance on. Absolutely. Great, great inputs, Matt. Uh, when do we see you back in India for a level two course again? Ah, uh, mate, uh, <laughs> that's a good question. At the moment, obviously, with things going on in the world, that's, um, that's yeah, that's not looking like any time soon. But yeah. I'd, I'd really like to come back. Like I said, the coaches we had there this year were – of a really high quality. They they love the discussion around, okay, why are we doing things and, and how are we going about it? And it was very much a, a fostering um, sort of environment rather than anyone trying to, um, to bring anyone down or develop themselves only. So, mate, if I get the chance to come back over there and spend a bit of time with you guys, it would be Absolutely. Uh, first one on the flight. Hopefully that happens soon, and uh, Kingfisher beer, beer shall be drunk. KB <laughs> <laughs> lights, mate. KB lights, sorry. <laughs> great, great. Thanks, Matt. Where, where can people find you if they have to do uh, some good questions and emails? Mate, probably, probably the best place would be uh, on Twitter. Uh, I have to check my, my Twitter <laughs> handle. Um, that... I'm probably on Twitter uh, two or three times a week just sort of checking out what's going on. So it would be at tread underscore M, T-R-E-D underscore M, for anyone that wants to flip me, uh, flip me a message or, or flip me any questions, I'm more than happy to chat. So that would probably be the best way to, to, to reach out and then if it needs to go any further than that, I'm more than happy to get in touch with people via email or whatever it may be. But feel okay. free. Now the guys know where to find you. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for making the time for this. Hopefully we'll meet soon. And then until then, you know, stay safe.